Okay, this is Ryan Womack, Data Librarian at Rutgers University. We are back for part three of the Data Visualization Video Workshop series. And in this segment, we are going to talk about important historical figures in the development of data visualization. We are still not going to get to any R examples or, or coding in this segment. So once again, if, if you're trying to fast forward to that, you can can safely skip this segment, but this one has a lot of interesting historical background. So uh, we actually start a bit later than I think what most people would expect. If you look prior to the late 18th century, uh, the only things that you'll really see that could be classified as data visualization are uh, maps, star charts, and that was where, you know, interesting graphical presentation of material uh, occurred. So, you know, people were plotting the, you know, the the movement of the planets and things like that. And but the idea of actually using charts to represent data, just pure data, appeared relatively late. And actually, there's one person, William Playfair, who is considered to be the pioneer of all these things, at least as they appeared in printed works. Now, we don't know what people were doing uh, privately, but um, Playfair is credited as being the first person to popularize the line chart, the bar chart, time series plots, the, the pie chart, uh, which we spent last segment complaining about. But, you know, that's a lot of um, innovation. And he has two uh, famous books focusing on the British economy, basically, British and world economy, uh, that are listed here. And you can actually, if you want to get a hold of a reprint edition of those, there is a, a nice reprint edition available, published recently by Cambridge. And you can delve into these at your leisure. So what are we talking about? Here's an example of an early bar chart. And what Playfair was trying to do was to uh, actually compare the cost of living. So this bar chart actually has two things on it. Uh, it has wages, the value of a typical day's worker's wages of, of a good mechanic, and the price of wheat. Um, so kind of making the, the point that wages were declining relative to other costs over time. Um, here's a line graph and also a time series plot of the balance of trade, you know, something that you would see in The Economist today uh, first appeared in print in William Playfair's work. So um, he's got the balance of trade and Playfair also was cognizant of these issues in in visualization, such as here we have this sort of narrow neck uh, in in orange, uh, and the human eye, I think we want to view that as as if we were floating down a river and looking at the banks and how far apart are the banks of the river. This almost seems like it's a constant gap because we tend to sort of reorient ourselves to the shape of that flow. Um, however, if you separate it and just purely look at the vertical gaps, you'll see, well, that's actually considerable variation here over this period. And um, those kind of issues were identified from an, an early point as well, just to make that point. Uh, this is another example from Playfair, just to show you that not everything he created uh, stuck, and, and you don't see a lot of these types of charts this is kind of a combination pie with, where the area of the country um, is the size of the circle combined with some kind of balance of trade uh, type comparisons. So uh, this particular style didn't really take off. Um, if you want to read a little bit more about it, um, last year's hit scholarly work of by Thomas Piketty uh, capital um, was 
did make use of similar sort of figures to, that William Playfair did. So there's an article here that talks about that and uh, also um, crit critiques his charts a little bit. So if that interests you, you can follow up on that link. Okay, so we've, we've seen Playfair, the innovator. The second uh, major figure that I want to talk about is Charles Joseph Minard, who was a French engineer in the 19th century. And although he was an engineer, he got into uh, also producing these kind of informative graphic displays. And the thing that he is most famous for is this image. Uh, you may have seen this before if you've read about data visualization elsewhere. If you haven't, uh, take a look at this. And this picture in particular uh, some people, like Edward Tufte, who we'll talk about in a second, um, and others, consider this to be one of the greatest information graphics ever. So you're looking at at history in the making here. Uh, the ideal that Tufte and others uh, really like is that you can compress a lot of information into one one image and still have it be accurate and informative. And that's exactly what happens here. So what is this uh, image about? It is about Napoleon's march to Moscow and retreat in um, 1812 and 1813. So if you're not familiar with that history, Napoleon got to Moscow, took it, uh, and sacked and destroyed a lot of things there, but had to retreat. Um, you can read about that in War and Peace a little bit. Um, and this, his army was devastated, especially on the retreat. Um, and it was sort of a major turning point for, for Napoleon. So the width of this line represents the size of the army. And it's actually plotted on a geographically accurate map. So we can see when they're crossing different rivers, moving through Poland and into Russia, uh, and it, it getting to Moscow. We can also see the side movements of some branches of the army. And then we can see as the army retreats how it get really gets thinned out to the, at one point here, there's only 4,000 people when it started at 122,000. Sorry, 422,000. So, um, you have all the detail there. You also have this uh, linkage to the temperature on the way back. Part of the problem was it was really freezing that winter uh, on the way back, and that, that really hampered the army as well. Uh, so all that information is, is preserved in detail, but it makes the this clear point, even if you don't read that detail, you can see, hey, that army got wiped out. <laughs> uh, there, there's no ambiguity about it. Um, there's also uh, a link here to a web page that will show you how to reproduce that chart in many different, not only R, but many different um, approaches. And also kind of an interesting side view into the ways you could think of data visualization. So um, that's an interesting link. So Menard didn't just do that one graph. He did uh, several other innovations. Uh, this is the type of chart that you would see again in the business magazine today. Uh, the What's going on here is actually the supply of food to Paris. So all of the province, French provinces, this is France that we're looking at, all of the French provinces that supplied some food to Paris are shaded in yellow. And then the size of the pie represents what is, how much is being supplied and the these uh, slices of the pie represent different things. So it's, it's actually uh, meat that's being supplied here. So we have some provinces supply mostly cows, some supply a mixture of cows and sheep and chickens, and uh, this shows that. So this is a use of, a, again, the, the dreaded pie chart, but it seems to be kind of okay in this context because we are really only focused on those broad proportions. Um, 
So that's the 19th century, and it's again surprising, at least to me, that a lot of these developments do not happen until pretty late in the game. Um, there was an increasing use in scientific research of plots, you know, just standard sort of line graphs and, and bar charts and things like that to record scientific results. So we do see that in the 19th century, but we don't really see innovation until later. Um, so y the, the next set of innovation that I'm going to talk about comes from the statistics world, and we're looking at people like Ronald Fisher, uh, you know, the, the Fisher's exact test and many other um, core basic statistical principles uh, came from Fisher. Uh, Fisher was an early person who said you need to plot the data to understand relationships. And so that kind of baked this approach into statistics. Uh, the second figure is John Tukey, who was a statistician at Princeton, and his work, Exploratory Data Analysis, which um, was published in the 1970s, and also the final slide of this um, presentation links you to, uh, and I'll fix that link, links you to a bibliography that has all these these references. So I'll fix that in the in the in the PowerPoint. So we're al already up to the 1970s, and Tukey was a person who emphasized not just the importance of graphics in presenting your results, but in understanding the data throughout the analysis from the beginning. And that is kind of a new approach. Uh, his book, Exploratory Data Analysis, was very influential. And he also innovated in terms of actual graphics as well. He is is credited with creating the box and whiskers plot and the stem and leaf plot, which we are going to see in the later segments. Okay, so now we are up to our much more modern figures. We're, we're up to Edward Tufte, and Tufte began publishing in the 1980s a series of books. Uh, the first one was the visual display of quantitative information, and those are really the most widely known works on data visualization today. And Tufte still gives a uh, very popular workshop series, and he continues to, to develop his approach. Now, if you review these books, you'll find there's actually considerable overlap between different uh, ones in the series, so you can dip into them and look at a couple of them. You don't have to feel like you have to read all those. Um, they're beautiful books to look at, most of them, because they have lots of really interesting visual examples. Um, but Tufte's ideal is expressed in that Menard image that we just looked at. This, again, this was Tufte's favorite. Uh, this ideal that you should compress a lot of information into one image. It should be elegant. It should be accurate, uh, but also dense. Um, and to me, his approach comes out of the printed world, where it might be very expensive to create a nice plate to put in a book. And so you better do it right. You better get as much information in there as you can. Um, I think that some of his advice has less relevance in a computer environment, where you can really let the user drive the show and let them generate more graphs if they want. Right. But these are direct quotes from Tufte expressing his ideals. Graphical elegance is often found in simplicity of design and complexity of data. Uh, then we have beautiful graphics do not traffic with the trivial. Um, so there's, there's something appealing to that emphasis on aesthetics. Um, and But there's perhaps a downside to that also. Uh, this is a, a, a graph that Tufte admires, and this is a, a, another 19th century French engineer graph from a, a guy named Mary, and what's going on here are every train 
between Paris and Lyon is plotted. Uh, so we have at the top left, we have a train leaving Paris at 6.30ish. It travels south, uh, crosses different cities, makes a stop in, let's say, La Roche around 10 a.m., keeps traveling, 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 and then it le reaches Lyon in at about 7.30 at night. So there was no TGV back in those days. Um, you can you can see some some of the progress that's been made since then. But these are all the trains, and also the trains traveling from Lyon to Paris as well. Now this schedule is a disaster from the point of view of s someone trying to buy a ticket. I mean it's very hard to see the exact times that something is going to depart. Um, just a little bit confusing, but it is extremely good for its intended purpose, which is for the train engineers to know when are the trains going to cross on the tracks. When do you have to make sure that someone's pulled over to the siding if there's not, you know, two-way track? Um, and by putting it all in one place, that's that's great for this purpose. And this meets Tufty's ideal of being compressed and dense and um, elegant in its own way, but not suitable for every purpose. Uh, I just wanted to summarize just a little bit more of Tufty's, some of Tufty's general principles. Um, this idea that graphics reveal data without distorting it, and he says, above all else, show the data. So these are, you know, those are good good principles to remember. Uh, he is credited with uh, emphasizing or, or uh, describing this idea of the small multiple, and that's a way of presenting data in discrete com comparable chunks so that it makes it easier to understand. And we're going to see we're going to see that in R in just a little while. Um, he's he talks about the lie factor, and this is another one that I want to spend a moment on. The lie factor is often can be a directly quantifiable um, effect that, that describes how much you've distorted your data. So the example that he gives in his early work of a lie factor is this kind of newspaper graph of the shrinking family doctor. All right, so what do we have here? We have the percentage of doctors in family practice has been shrinking from 1964 to 1990. And we see a big doctor here going down to a little doctor. This little doctor looks a lot smaller than this doctor, right? Um, but the percentage went from 27 to 12 percent. Now, psychologically, again, if I took those numbers away and I just asked you what the difference was, uh, you'd probably say this guy was smaller than half of this one. The reason for that is the area that this doctor takes up is much smaller than half, uh, but the height is proportional. Here the height is proportional with 27% being full-sized, and this is just under half the height. However, you know, given what's being shown here, um, that is a distortion because we, we tend to perceive the area and the area is shrinking faster than the height is. So, and even if you stop to think about it, you, even if you're aware of this issue, subconsciously you've still got that impression. Uh, it's hard to, to escape it uh, that, that something is going on that makes this like really small, even if we try to correct for it. So he really emphasized, don't use those techniques in a graph. Don't use area to represent a linear relationship, for example. Um, and that kind of fits with the second related concept of graphical integrity, uh, that you, you don't try to lie or cheat or hide something with the way you present it. Let the data speak for itself. Let the data vary, but not the design. Um, so, and I'm not going to go through all these um, these points, but I will show you 
that not everything that he talked about has really, I would say, caught on. He, at, at one point, he was promoting this idea called the spark line, uh, where there is a small bit of graphics that can be inserted into a document, into a print publication. Uh, in this case, the example is a stock price. So, you know, you're reading along and you, s you have a table of stock prices and next to it there's a, a tiny little graphic that shows you the, the recent stock price movements. This again is something that, you know, maybe it comes out of the print world. It's not really necessary anymore when you're able to look on a website and with one click pull up a full chart of this, the stock prices movements. Um, but, you know, he has been very innovative. And I'll conclude my, my discussion of Tufty with this final example where we have the um, Napoleon march to Moscow and retreat uh, revisited from the point of view of maybe a bad PowerPoint presentation. And uh, as an aside, that's another thing that P Tufty is um, very against. <laughs> uh, the He's written a book called The Cognitive Style of PowerPoint. Also interesting to take a look at that that kind of presentation uh, has really uh, caused a lot of problems and tends to lead to things like this. Now this graph actually has all the same kind of information on it. Uh, the number of soldiers, the retreat, but notice how the graphical elements are no longer um, telling the full story. You know, we, we don't have that elegant narrowing of the line. We don't have precise geographical positioning. And we just kind of cluttered it up with some, you know, not so nice elements here. Just to make the point that maybe aesthetics do matter uh, more than, than some might want to think in terms of our perception of, of the graphics. Okay, so we've talked about these historical figures. We have talked about um, some of our uh, early examples of what's bad. And so now that we've thought about that for a little bit, let's go back to pies and talk about, well, why, in a more theoretical sense, why is the pie chart bad? A pie chart has low data density. That's our Tufty terminology. We're, we're just got this big area of pie without a lot of things uh, going on in it. We introduce these perception problems. We're not really using the other structures to kind of order the, the numbers or categories when we're using a pie. Um, and there's another approach, a guy named Gary Class, who um, has an interesting take on it. And his website is a little slow, but what he um, refers to are three problems that are potential with data, data ambiguity, data distortion, and data distraction. And I just kind of throw that in there as um, another way that you might want to think about how these work. And it looks like at the time of recording, uh, we're having trouble getting through to that site, but hopefully that link will come up later. Um, so let me conclude this section here uh, with just uh, at least one example of a pie chart that is not distorting the data. Here the, 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 the pie chart is representing the data itself, the pie eaten and the pie not eaten. So we could maybe give this one a pass and say pie chart will work in this case. All right, we are going to talk a little bit about a couple of more historical figures that introduce our R examples uh, in just a minute. But let me close this, this segment.